Welcome to an upper room where I'm very glad to have you here, perhaps with a coffee just to enjoy um, a presentation of something which really comes from an experience of my life and some observations really about a corporate journey. Uh, who am I and why would I be presenting this to you? My life towards the last part of my working life was as a principal teaching fellow at a leading university business school and my observations were really that we were teaching uh, people to, in my case, be entrepreneurial. So I taught entrepreneurship and new venture creation and during that time I would pick up from people I met, extraordinary people or books I'd read, things that made me think. And so what I'd like to do today is to present with you in a hopefully relaxed environment um, a PowerPoint of pictures alongside a commentary to really illustrate, I think pictures tell a thousand words, don't they? How some of these think spots have led me to, um, I think what I could only describe is releasing people and releasing people into being who they really are and how to relate to other people in a corporate setting as something that releases people rather than controls them. So I'm gonna be dealing with some really quite hopefully revealing but challenging issues that by the time I finish the presentation you'll say oh could we really could we really do that and particularly I would think see this as a father and a mother looking at your children being able to do more than you could ever do to release them rather than for everything to be around us you and I bring up three words which I think are really um, an assumption I suppose I have to make an assumption that greed is not helpful fear is not helpful and ego is not helpful and often when those things are present we can make decisions based on a filter through those three aspects and more of that will come out I hope during the presentation. So moving on to the presentation we are relating very much the story that I'm going to tell you to a corporate journey and I'm going to reveal a diagram where the diagram on the, the screen, which will be beside me, is a very simple drawing, which I did. And I draw inspiration from people. And one of the men who really came into my life early on is a man called James Odgers. And he ran an organization called the Beeson Trust. And he used to take young people through this as an expression of their journey. So I'm taking the picture that he showed and just uh, taking a... Um, a kind of moment just to say a very very simple little story around a journey. So here we are on the left hand side in sort of a place where we're bunkered down, we feel safe, it's maybe uh, where we prefer to be. We then move out into a place where we meet other people, almost like around a fire, we get to know people. We then go into the landscape represented by the trees here and the landscape is a place where really things start to emerge from us as to maybe things that are sort of are only possible when we're stepping out. We then go into what I would call a valley, a place of testing. We then go perhaps into some measure of success. And at that point, it seems to me that the whole journey is about us coming down to then help other people over obstacles that are now possible for us to help other people rather than for it all to be about our success. And I love this expression to go from success to significance. So the first part of your life is success which is probably to get to the top of the mountain. And the latter part of your life could be, especially in parenting terms, uh, into significance. Something that's a legacy that will last after you've gone. So already the language around this very simple diagram will give us an indication of the way that I'm going to take you. I talk about people who have really inspired me. Um, one particular gentleman called Professor Charles Handy. He was at London Business School. He was very much a leading professor in the area of organisational behaviour and, and, and organisations. And he came and I met, because he was presenting at my university at the time, um, a, a whole area of seeing the kind of almost bondage that people can be in in their working environments. And he talked and then I subsequently bought a very easy read. It's not an academic text, this at all a book called The Empty Raincoat, and I'm just going to read what it says on the front of this book. The Empty Raincoat is to me 
the symbol of our most pressing paradox. If economic progress means that we become anonymous cogs in some great machine, then progress is an empty promise. The challenge must be to show how paradox can be managed. What an arresting comment. It is so easy to go into an organisational setting, to go into something that's a job or passing some qualification, where you actually say to people, this is who I am because of what I've done. In, in many ways, this paradox is about how do we become who we really are to be and then to do from our being rather than to become something that fits into a corporate structure. And that is interesting because Charles Handy representing this empty raincoat, as I understand it, it was a kind of bronze statue and the statue represents the corporate clothing, what we wear as an office or as a positioning statement. But we've actually died inside because the real us never comes to the fore. We're sort of hiding behind the sort of corporate setting and the, um, the, 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 the trappings, I suppose, of a job or a job title. So it's, it's something that's really challenging and it challenged me at the time and it made me think about entrepreneurship and developing organisations in our true identity. So let's just for a moment have a look at the great machine he mentions. And I used some research that was done by Churchill and Lewis in 1985. There were others um, who have also done work in looking at organisational structure and form. So on the diagram, you see at the start of the business or the organisational, um, that we are in a place of existence where we start an organisation, there's not very many people involved, and the circle that's represented in the blue is the organisation, but the individual is the circle represented here. And at the time when the business is really just as a kind of lifestyle business in the early stages, the owner and the business are one. So people are spending all their time, and you've heard this many times about sort of running a business. And then there seems to be a decision that people take as to whether they disengage and sell out, Serial entrepreneurs do this and they then find another organization and they do very well out of selling the organization. But then you might go for growth. This is the alternative. But the organization, it's described as going on a kind of sigmoid curve of growth. And then it matures. And by the time it matures, it's actually become a significant, often hierarchical organizational structure. And the owner, perhaps because they've taken on finance or they've taken on some relinquishing of the ownership of the organization through usually money by giving some of the equity away they are less the business they become less than the size of the blue circle here but nonetheless i would argue that there is the personality of the founder who has made the culture and the forming of that organizational setting so this coming from the kind of background very um, um, simple kind of diagrammatic form I then moved to another book by a man called Danny Miller. Now, Danny Miller describes through the um, mythology, if you like, of Icarus. Um, Icarus, if you recall, was in prison with his son and he developed the ability to fly by gumming uh, feathers to his arms and then he flew out of the prison. And in their exuberance to fly, they flew to near the sun and then they came down, crashing into the sea. And so, the expression of Danny Miller's Icarus paradox describing organisations is that they are very successful in the early days with a type of strategy and then they fly only myopically, short-sightedly, in that one dimension of growth. They can't see another strategy. So looking at the, um, the, 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 this diagram, he talks about pioneering companies. These are very, very entrepreneurially new ideas, they're the groundbreakers with invention. But when they look to develop, they always are looking for new invention as the strategy to get them out of trouble or into new opportunities. And sometimes the new invention is not as significant as the old and the initial founding invention and they escape out of reality. So there's something about that strategy eventually will make them um, die effectively. And then there are organisations that are run by people who are very good at, um, at acquiring and organising and processing and they, they venture. They, they are very good at sort of acquisition and they then become imperialist 
says Danny Miller, and they die like all empires because they start to acquire as the strategy of growth. The sales companies, equally exciting, are very, very much about sort of for, uh, fighting sort of on markets and taking new market ground and they penetrate markets. They're very good in sales. And then they find it very difficult to not take on battles that are outside their core business. Um, I mean, a classic, just to give an example, say Gillette, brilliantly premium corporate, who would then take on, say, a French company called BIC, making disposable uh, biros, but now disposable razors, would migrate into a low value, high volume marketplace. So they decouple or they drift from their particular core business. It's a great danger of a sales led company. And then there was craftsman companies, very, very good at detail, very, very good at systems, very good at organizing. They become so focused that they tinker. They only make incremental change around the edges. They cannot come out of it. So very successful strategies for growth, but they don't have the next ability to see with the other lenses, if you like, to see, see the next stage. So if I was to draw and overlay um, the um, the kind of hierarchical envisioner, I would call them, type of person running the pioneer company, or the enabler, using sort of phrases of where people's characteristics are, or the evangelist, I'll use that word, of someone who's very good at selling and someone who is very good at enacting and making things happen in the detail. Each one of those are phenomenal strengths and talents, but if each one is myopically running the hierarchy, then unfortunately that's the way that everybody else sees through that one founder's lens. So there's about founders and whether they can see other people in the corporate team who can see with lenses that are different to theirs or do they see them as counterproductive or disruptive. And this is a real challenge, particularly if greed or ego or fear are part of the, 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 the centre of the kind of driver for the business, the motivational driver. Returning to Charles Handy, he talks about the kind of second curve thinking. He talks about, in his, his book, The Empty Raincoat, that we start on the first trajectory, the business, as I've just been describing, in success. And then he says that it's very interesting how on a season change, when the season changes, and the capability has to also change to bring us into a new dimension. But if we're myopic in the way that we see, we would stay on the only way of seeing is that things will continue into this trajectory where change is not seen until it's too late. So often it's not that there's an issue, except that we need to see with the lens of someone else in our team who can actually say, have you seen this new dimension? Have you seen this new opportunity? So leadership is about different types of people, perhaps in the vessel, in the boat, some that can see in the crow's nest, some that can see from the steering of the wheel, some can see from one side or other side of the boat. But each one of them has a perspective or a lens capability that other people need to be embracing within the family. So that's a sort of little bit of background about how I was impacted by some really significant inputs into my thinking. Another lady, 1959, um, she wrote as an economist uh, a book and very interesting about looking at small firms and large firms. And she wrote this rather uh, challenging in many ways uh, sentence. The differences in administrative and um, structure of very small and very large firms are so great that in many ways it's hard to see that they're the same species or genus. And we cannot describe a caterpillar and use the same definition for a butterfly. Now, I believe she was looking at the difference between small and large firms still in their hierarchical form. But what this led me to believe is, if there is a metamorphosis, if there is a change from a small firm to a medium sized to a large firm, could there be stages where they go from a stage of maybe um, a caterpillar into maybe, uh, sorry, an egg, a caterpillar, a chrysalis and a butterfly. Are there times of change where to get into a new vehicle for a new season, a new vehicle being a caterpillar is very different from an egg, or an egg is dependent on resources, um, the caterpillar can forage for resources, so it becomes a different vessel for a different purpose. To migrate into that new stage for then finally the butterfly, which is the releasing of the next generation, 
it's that idea that there may be something really significant about how we encode or, or how we release even the next generation before we ourselves pass over the baton into the capability of the new. And that would seem very, very winning in terms of this phrase, you can't describe a small and a large firm as the same. I quite agree, but I think there's another dimension. It's about something much more um, organic, much more about creation in terms of how the design by God has been put into, say, a caterpillar to a butterfly. So my own uh, thoughts at this time were that if we were in an egg stage, that's when we have resources for the short term. We're laid um, and we are found on the ground, but then we need to be able to forage and we need to be able to understand how to be resilient, yes, quite vulnerable in our growth in the vessel of a caterpillar, but then we need to lay down the resources that we have for the express purpose of becoming a vessel for releasing the next generation. So there's something about this capability over time and the, the approach to how we are traveling still towards this releasing of others rather than to control resources. Let's just return to the diagram that I mentioned at the very beginning. And I want to take us through each stage and just put a little bit more insight, if I can, into what each one of these may look like if we were traveling on this journey, on an entrepreneurial pathway or a corporate journey. Here we are, <clears throat> I could even say in a pyramid or a house or somewhere we're comfortable. And often we stay comfortable because we get fed. <laughs> we feel that it's safer inside the cage than it is outside. And I've just drawn a little kind of eye of the seeding of something that's within us, which is a hunch or it's a seed or potential that each one of us senses. Often we ignore it, but I think there's something that we can see. And we discover it like treasure buried in a field. It's something that we can either ignore or we can say, I want to go with it. You hear of many entrepreneurial relationships where people discover something which they just keep going because they believe in the values or the, 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 the stirring in their hearts to do something. So it's that kind of idea. And there are people who recognize a similar resonance, a similar dimension of that same passion, that same coming together. And we're attracted to kindred spirits. We're attracted, even with our different lenses, to come in together in agreement and passion around this thing. I just want to give a couple of examples. When I was at my university, I brought together, uh, in a rather um, challenging uh, program I put on, uh, MBA students with PhDs studying for their PhDs. So you might find a chemist doing a PhD coming together with um, the, the MBA cohort. So the groups that we set together were to come up with something that would be an entrepreneurial opportunity and they were assessed um, for bringing these very different streams together. One of the groups that I was so excited to see around this kind of moment was a young man who came from America. He'd been in, a, uh, in, 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 in medical sort of uh, volunteer in South Africa. He'd seen some horrendous examples of them picking up kerosene, the young children from the local tuck shop, they call them, where they buy their provisions, walking home, getting their clothing covered in kerosene, and then maybe an open fire, and these poor little children would be burned. And the mothers would have problems from the respiratory issues of burning this kerosene in their townships. And Will mentioned this to a group of students as an idea of the project. And the young man, his name was Adam, from the chemistry department at the university said, we must do something to stop this. So you can see immediately that he would bring his talent and his capability of coming up was what they did, in fact, was to bring a biofuel, a non-combustible um, or ignitable uh, spontaneous combustion fuel, unlike kerosene, from the waste oil that would be found from restaurants in South Africa and they could be selling this and making it in little units within the townships in South Africa as the product. And this just inspired the group to come together around something that was without greed, without ego, and without fear. I've also met some brothers, funny enough, in South Africa, as I mentioned South Africa, who were in Bredarsdorp, which is north of South Africa, and their father had a farm. And they were very interested in the idea of making uh, growing proteus and heathers from South Africa. And as brothers, they came together 
One was a seer, one could see, another one was a harmonizer, and one was someone who could make things happen. He was much more implemented. We'll come to that in a minute. But I also saw the passion in these brothers, having started an organization which was now selling flowers all over the world and also employing a lot of people in South Africa. But it came around a sort of shared passion. In that case, it was brothers. So these are just examples of what this looks like. I also saw the same thing at Stanford University when I went there, where they have what I would only describe as playrooms where ideas are brought together with people with different faculties or different functions or different interests, all honing in on a shared passion. I really think this is pivotal. And I believe that agreement around this idea or this passion is where two and three come together and agree, regardless of their perspective, their talents, they contribute towards something and, a, and, and, and it is just a place of such exciting unity and blessing when this happens. It's to, be ca it's to be seen to see how this can happen. Unfortunately, uh, as, as I'm showing in the diagram, um, it says here, another loser has been, fades into obscurity. So often the organisational expectation or even parental expectation or, or society's expectations on us is to fit in a system that exists. And often the rejection that you feel flying outside the cage, I use the cage only because of this being quite an amusing uh, cartoon, is actually very freeing, but it's also quite concerning about where people have a very organised life and a predictable life to be in this entrepreneurial freedom. It's quite challenging. I also like this uh, cartoon, The Butterfly Freedom. Why do you fly outside the box? I fly outside the box because I can. But we know the box. We're safe inside the box. That, my friend, is why I leave it for... You may be safe, but I'm free. So there's this aspect of breaking the mould, following your heart and your passion, and joining others with shared passion. So vision is, I think, about seeing as a body of people, a corporate, a body. It's about relational exchange. It's about different lenses as seasons and landscapes change. We need different people to be almost at the helm when the landscape demands a different lens to anticipate change. And it's really interesting. It says without the vision uh, and seeing this way through composite and corporate lenses, I think we perish. Myopia is here I'm using the expression, we create isms, things that become almost um, the, the, the very prism in a sense, or prison, and it's a kind of ism myopia, I call it. It's only short-sightedness with the vision we have, and we then try to make that the driver. And I think that is like Icarus. We fly too near the sun often in our own perspective without drawing the relational context of other people. It's about relationship. So moving on, I'm sure you now can see how these environments are really how we progress on a journey to be on this entrepreneurial pathway. So language, and I use these words with great thanks to a man called James Thwaites. He and I were working on something. His environment was really very interesting. He was looking at how man has organized religion around church. Again, it's a sort of hierarchical structure, isn't it? So often you see these... Um, isms like you know using method ism or it, it kind of has a you join us because this is how we see it but you join that one if you see it a different way and you can see that relates to the corporate world and he talks about the church beyond the congregation or the church that works and some of this language or <laughs> I use language here has come from his experience of how things can transition from agreement into language to be releasing so I thank Jim Thwaites for this um, insight into this language we, we came to agree together about. But language is the next stage. And this is when we meet people in a social environment, in, a, in, a, in an environment of those early days where we get to know each other. I call it round the fire, because this is something that really is about a composite language, a sort of clarity of vision emerges. And some have wisdom, some have understanding, some have knowledge. It's a place of relational, um, uh, forming and, and a place of resilience will be formed out of these relationships. These are very important early stages for an organization. How we get to know each other and how things really start to be about how we can cover each other in our weaknesses and our strengths. 
And I love this expression um, in, um, in Shakespeare, <laughs> to be or not to be, that is the question. And I think that actually to be is very, very significant because our true identity is from that that we, we become um, active, we become um, talented, we, we go with the grain of our talent. And so it's about doing from our being, not being from our doing. Going to a party and saying I'm a particular function or a job is often the way we describe ourselves, but the real person, as Charles Handy calls it, is behind the raincoat, is behind the outer covering of the organisational setting. So this is an exciting way of seeing this relational context as we see the corporate journey. I'm going to illustrate this now with really some iconography, I suppose, which helps, I think, sometimes to see. I think water is a very, very interesting fluid element and it's a very powerful element. It's good if it's in the right place. It's not so good if it's in the wrong place. And envisioners to me represent this refreshing of ideas, this, 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 they see possibilities linked to water. Sand or land is a very safe place to ground things and I think enabler types are very good at, um, at, at seeing the process and things can land, it's safe. So water is safe in the desert in a sense. And then there's people that ignite, people who fire things up. They're always wanting to sort of get things going. And they're the enactors. They're very good at seeing practice and application. And of course, water in the desert is safe and fire in the desert is safe. The difficulty is without the enablers, you can have conflict between those that are like creative people who don't necessarily see through the same lens as people who are much more focused on action. So these are just some illustrations of really the types or the, the bandwidth of the forming team. I see these as essential to forming anything that is going to sustain these different facets of the original Danny Miller story. There is the envisioners who are the pioneers and the, the builders and the uh, craftsmen. So each one of those would resonate with those that Danny Miller mentioned prior to this. So the way I see it is around this amazing um, agreement, around this amazing passion, we see the envisioning, the enabling and the enacting like a kind of alignment or sort of creative uh, process of a baton being transferred between those that have lenses that can see very high and wide, some that can see things much more focused and some can see much nearer the ground in a sense. So there is this sense of how a process is being set up almost like a product development process through different lenses. Woe betide, obviously, if each one of these ends up trying to run the organisation on their own. The reason that is an issue, and I throw this as, as, as a thought, in vision, as it seems to me, can so easily, as we see from the Danny Miller picture, go into fantasy and try to over, over imagine what might be the picture they're getting the enablers who are very, very good at harmonising. Love can be quite controlling if you don't want people to get hurt. So there can be a kind of risk aversion that makes them quite controlling. And then there are people who are very good at making things happen, and the ends justify the means to get things started, can sometimes go off on their own and they can be in denial. They can ignore all the things they're being told and become very focused and that can cause denial. So you can imagine when fantasy and control and denial meet, we need a relational setting where people can be understanding of the shadow side of the tendencies of these people. With greed, ego and fear playing into this, it becomes quite a toxic cocktail and we need to understand how to harmonise and understand each other and love each other. So coming back to the Danny Miller um, Icarus paradox, you can see how if each one of these ends up running the organisation, there is great danger that the personality and the the, the, the culture and the values of that organisation will be led by that kind of individual sightline or that individual lens. Now, coming on to the land, which I call stories or parables or on the landscape, things start to happen now because as we get onto the land, our idea or our um, concept or whatever we're doing is then revealed as we engage with reality. We start to maybe make a test product, we make a foray into the market. And I'm alerted now to another author who impacted me, it was a man called Eric Reese, who's written really about what's called lean startup. It's where you don't get vast sums of money 
to pay for your growth, your idea becomes a product or a test product and then you gather data on it in the marketplace and you build, you measure and you learn. And there's an iterative process. There's a kind of time to pivot and to modify. There's a time to uh, leave your trajectory. And it's a time of the iteration of how on the landscape we start to change our initial premise into a changing plan. And this conveniently is also interesting for a man called John Mullins who wrote with um, Randy Commissar uh, from London Business School about plan B, getting to plan B. Plan A is often, if we're not careful, an idolatrous thing that we're aiming for to get an ideal and then suddenly we need to be really saying no, plan B is modified so that the investors, the people working with the individual can see that there is a much more important stage that modifies in the light of the landscape that we occupy. And then we come to a place of resourcing. Resources to me is a very challenging time and a lot of things get hijacked at this point. I used to deal a lot with business plan presentations and the whole idea of presenting ideas for finance. Um, indeed, I've worked in, in, in this internationally to an extent in, in how do we get our ideas and our concepts funded. Often it may be because we get into debt or we give away equity in terms of venture capital. And this could be very controlling in the early days because so much of the equity is given away that the money and the response to how we pay the money back or how do we play a sort of role with the shareholder to get their return, often exiting the business because the investor wants to have an exit, we can govern through the resources that we acquire a control or a limiting factor to the release. This is a very challenging valley time. So the valley to me is a place where physical, financial and human resources um, are part of our future, but they're not conditional or limiting on future decisions. There's a lot more we could do on this, but it is a place where I believe we can see the release of so many because of the resourcing and even more philanthropic seeding of the exponential growth that can happen through this um, of this type of paying forward as we'll see in the future. So how we require the acquire the resources and what limits are put on it can often very much damage the freedom of the firm to fly. So here's a danger point. When we start to look now at our team, we've actually developed through these various stages in the valley, we've now picked up what I would consider the people that can, sorry, the, um, the, the going through the landscape, we can see people who can see on the landscape and they're very good communicators and this is where I think the sales function who can see the market they can be out there giving us feedback are very much the the voice of what's happening in reality they bring truth the people who I call the resource gatherers the people who are much more um, disciplined into setting up sort of maybe systems are people who I would call resource gatherers so in the valley we need these people to come alongside the organization maybe in that case with more of a financial um, putting uh, much more sensible communications to how to draw resources into the firm. I think we also need non-executive directors who are overseers, people who have been through and are now overseers who can see the game of chess in a sense from a distance. So the organisational form is now becoming, yes it's become a kind of caterpillar and a chrysalis, it becomes a much fuller vessel ready to now become what I consider to be the butterfly stage. So we've now got the envisioners and then the evangelists. They have a lens of bringing truth, which helps enormously with the enablers. And then the, the resource gatherers or the people that can edify, then drawing forward to the enactors that are making things happen. So we've now got more talent with different lenses and capabilities drawing the vision into something that is um, many lenses of the vision and able to navigate when times change. I believe that is when we start to see almost inevitable pioneering success. We see fruit coming because something is aligning us. The, the, the relationship with our consumers, our customers, each other, it starts to become almost in a river that's flowing as opposed to something that has blockages in the way. Again, could be a lot more said about this growth in this point, but the danger here is not the growth, it's the staying on the top of the mountain. It's the staying in this, we're successful, and trying to sort of almost live on the top of this mountain. 
I believe that what happens is in this growth that we've started with the egg, the caterpillar, the chrysalis, and now the butterfly is inevitable to pay forward for us to see the next generation. So I'd like to then spend a moment just looking at how we developed from this diagram. We found the three, now the, 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 the team assembling, and now I want to talk about what the butterfly actually looks like as a releasing, almost product development, uh, shepherding environment to releasing other people. It's a place of gathering, we come down and we decide that as we are coming down, we are looking for a generational release for others who will be doing far more than we could ever do. It's a legacy, it's significance, it's multiplication. So having seen this diagram in this way, I'd like to perhaps just summarize at this point by saying that we get agreement, we get language, a landscape where we really start to find out yes, who we are, but what is the real essence of truth of what it is we're doing? Resources. This is about really being challenged about getting resources that release us, not control us. It's about pioneering, call that success, and significance is when we gather and when we release others to do far more than we can. So we now have a kind of journey of release, not control, not imprisoning, not bringing people into their false identity and into their um, empty raincoats. So this stage here is the relational stage and we move into what I would call the territorial stage where we know on the landscape more about ourselves and more about um, what it is we're doing. And then finally progressional is more about what happens paying forward than actually progressional in becoming successful. I think progressional is actually paying forward. It is far more significant in this regard. So we pick up our identity we pick up our calling on the land, we pick up the resilience and the character and authenticity and then the capability, the capability to release others. That is what the organisation, if it's really going to be releasing, should be. And families and communities. So just now moving into the sort of final stages of how to describe how this really has impacted me into what um, is, is evidence, I think, from Harvard Business School, we hear from Ori Braffman and Ron Beckenstrom. They set up this, this, this insight, which really impacted me again, of the starfish and the spider, the unstoppable power of leaderless organizations. It sounds like anarchy. Far from it. What they describe is that the spider is an organization where all of the control is in the head, and if you take off the head, the spider dies. Again, a metaphor from, from, from nature. And a starfish, extraordinarily, it is a flatter structure. And if you were to abuse it or put it under persecution, one leg becomes another starfish. So if your strategy on the barrier reef to get rid of starfish is to chop them in half, you actually get more starfish. So there's something about leadless organizations which can replicate themselves. Because once they have been in this organizational form, they are resilient to reproduce even the bits that are missing if they have already experienced that in their growth. So there's something very winning about this metaphor. So to really now put us on the edge of our seats, in many ways, what if we were to run an organization in reverse to the way I've taken you? I've almost been keeping my powder dry to say this towards the end. If I put the same words as we have been traveling, what if I started with a vision of how the future from the right hand side to the left was something which I have as an idea, a vision, you hear about vision, you need a vision, and then I order it. I don't release, I order it. I write a business plan. And then I say, I've got a business plan and this is what I'm going to do. I then gather people around it. Do you believe in it? Do you actually enjoy sort of coming to me and, and joining this exciting journey? And then we set off, we pioneer, and then we get resources. And this is the dangerous bit. We then get people to fund and then so ultimately control the way this organization will go. We go onto the landscape with our resources, we control it. We control markets, we control people, we control everything we do. And then the language that we send, what is it we do? What's our brand? Who are we? Can you imagine this is the way we set up a business? Mostly, my experience is this is the way people set businesses up. And then if you want to join us, we have a corporate agreement. This is what we do if you want to join us in our ism. 
It's kind of, you join us, you agree with us. If you don't, you leave. This is actually a stronghold. It's the way that so many organizations are formed. And to look at this in a different way, this hierarchy or this um, from the top down leadership is about repeating this again, vision, order, we order, we gather, get people to believe in it. We pioneer, we step out, we get resources, we get a landscape, we actually control our market, our niche. The language that we speak to e each other is kind of like a corporate validation. We then get a corporate agreement and we get an idea. This is how an ism starts. We want to strive for an ideal. We then get an ideology. You join us and it's a spider. It's a hierarchical organization, which is actually chop it off at the top and it dies. In my experience, prior to almost having these insights, I could see how Charles Handley's empty raincoat, I could see how the Icarus paradox, I could see all of these things relating to the left-hand side. Restoring our understanding from the way that we've come on our journey to produce something which is releasing, rather than ideologies and, and myopic. What about agreement, language, landscape? We have an agreement, we develop a language, of relationship. We go onto the land, we start to understand, resources come because we're now starting to go with the flow. We set off into this pioneering success and then we develop into significance, gathering, ordering, the release of others into the vision that we now have. So it's unity, it's agreement, it's wisdom. There's something about wisdom that's quite, quite a significant phrase in terms of a seeing in a language corporately. But then we need understanding. So as we get onto the landscape, we get more understanding. We get more wisdom into counsel, into what to do. We then start to get confidence as we get onto the land. We start to pioneer. We then get success into significance. We know now how to pay forward and how to become a starfish, how to become an organizational form that is far more about releasing others rather than controlling resources. So what I've really demonstrated here is the direction we choose to travel. The left-hand side, perhaps more driven by greed, how much I can get out of it, ego, how I will be perceived, and fear, almost the driver for so many of these organizations on the left. Fear of failure, fear, otherwise I'll get sacked. But on the right-hand side, it's more about love, not fear. It's more about generosity, not greed, and in, more about others than ego and myself, hence the reason it's easier to pay forward. So looking at this metamorphosis of an organization again, I want to just for a moment look at what the butterfly of release looks like. And I'm going to use product development as an example. Imagine that our organization has got the envisioning, it's got the enabling, it's got the enacting, it's got the people that are very much about communication and truth, resourcing and oversight. It's from this place that if someone joins the organization into the center core of its values and its nature, it then can go into a place which I would almost call a, a playroom of letting them develop their ideas. One of the places I visited is Mondragon in the Basque region of, of um, uh, in, in, the Bar, in the Basque country. And what they've done is they've set up a cooperative where people can draw from their own passion, almost like an incubator for a journey for their ideas from their corporate sort of uh, support network, set up ideas. So they would have typically a concept test, something that they want to play with as an idea that they mull around. And they've got people who have got envisioning capability and enable uh, and, 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 and truth giving possibilities to, to help them to develop these concepts. They might then go into, well, is it going to be from a qualitative point of view? Is it fast? Is it green? Is it red? Does it go very fast? So we're now starting to develop the concept into something that's got a much more resilience. We then say, right, in our organizational form, developing other people, what is the viability? Is it going to be focused into understanding whether it's going to be um, requiring this amount of resource? Is it going to be charging that amount to make it viable? What are the kind of viability um, factors? And then we might make a product as a test product. And if that works out on the landscape, we then may have a test market where we expand it even further. So all the time, people are starting to look at relationship, they're starting to look at territory, and now we're looking at progression, where we can take people from market testing into full launch and to release them. It starts with unity. We then get wisdom. We then get 
understanding, and all of these words resonate within the spaces that people come into their true identity. Counsel, confidence, knowledge, because now we've got a test market, we understand more, and then we can be able to pay forward so that other people can make it through this process, actually of being this releasing organization to become an entrepreneurial paying forward capability. There's been a lot of analogies, a lot of stories, a lot of examples I've given. I want to just quote, quite strangely in the way that I'm putting this, from something that I found in the Bible some years ago, which really encouraged me, particularly to do with the shape and the form of this organisational setting. In a way, there's nothing new under the sun. It says in Job 38, verses 22 to 23, Have you entered the storehouse of the snow, or have you seen the storehouse of the hail? which I have reserved for the time of distress, for the time of war and battle. And I really do think that there's actually a lot of distress out there, don't you? And there's a lot of tension which would lead to war and battle. And what is the secret of the storehouse in the snow? Not surprisingly, it's exactly that shape of the butterfly for something that's already been designed for us to understand a pathway of a corporate journey of the body of people coming together in harmony, coming together in a kind of flatter relationship just with this in mind, I want to, just for a moment, look historically at how people have achieved things where they were rejected. I want to refer to families like the Cadburys. They came together, as others did at that time, having been rejected by, um, because of their faith as Quakers, they decided that they would set up organisations with four bottom lines, we would call it. So we have a bottom line of finance and money. We all know about that. But they would have a social bottom line, an environmental bottom line, and a spiritual bottom line. So everything within their board decisions were made around that kind of um, outcome or fruit of what they were doing. They were always looking to encourage and to improve and to bless rather than to take it all unto themselves. There are many examples in history of companies who were formed, be it, um, I think Barker's Bank was one, Whitbread, the brewing company, were also setting up in the early stages to improve society and to release people rather than to necessarily control them, which is the way of the empty raincoat and the way we want to maybe see a new way which is there for us if we choose to take it. So thank you for listening and thank you just for sharing just some insights into something that sees a journey a different way from the way that maybe we have been used to being in a cage, not able to fly.